Good afternoon to you. Just wait for company Airbus 319 to go behind you, then push back to approve face to the south. London Heathrow, Europe's biggest and busiest airport, transporting more than 73 million passengers every year. Just your passport, please. That's fine. How many passengers? Six. This is so big. This is so complex. It's Gatwick on steroids. <laughs> With the flights taking off or landing every 45 seconds, Heathrow is operating at full capacity, and there's no room for error. You know, if Heathrow sneezes, the rest of Europe and the world catches a cold. We could have blown some of it, is that what you're saying? Even the smallest problem can cause chaos. 915 and 919 have been cancelled. Nothing is landing, nothing's taking off. And cost the billion pound business a fortune in fines and lost revenue. The responsibility is huge, can get extremely stressful. This series goes behind the scenes. This is the bit no one sees. To follow the hidden army of staff working against the clock to get thousands of planes away on time. It does give you a rush. Just watch his tail, guys. If... Wow, look at you. The size of a small city, Heathrow has its own police force. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask you to come with me, please? Hello, we got here for you. Paramedics and religious leaders. From the cleaners and baggage handlers. Yeah, we'll lock it and run over me toes. To the air traffic controllers and CEO. Hi, nice to meet you. The executive. Everyone has a vital role to play. All good clean field. In keeping Britain's most famous airport flying. It's in the hands of God, really. American 135, hold position, contact ground 121.7. You know when you come in at the start of the day that your whole day is going to be full on from about 6 o'clock in the morning till about 11 o'clock at night. Air traffic controller Paul Hooper is starting his shift. 567. Yep. Speed at 287, monitor the tower on 118.5. OK, lovely. Happy. Cheers, Tom. All yours. Initially. It's been 927, continue approach. You are uh, number two now, the winds are 040, 11 knots. He'll land a plane every minute and a half until his break. Scene 4308, vacate first right, contact ground on 121.19. Controllers are only allowed to work for 90 minutes before they're required to rest for half an hour. It's a very challenging and demanding job. Behind you, then push On a busy arrival hour, we'll probably land about 45 aircraft in that hour. Aircraft flying in from 84 countries depend on Paul and his team keeping Heathrow's two runways open. If Heathrow sneezes, the rest of Europe and the world catches a cold. It's, you know, we lose a runway here, it, it could have a knock-on effect in Europe and throughout the rest of the world, you know, because aircraft are already in the skies coming into Heathrow. They can't just turn back and go back to where they came from. Virgin 4-5 Whiskey, contact land on 134.125. It's not just down to the controllers to make sure incoming planes land on time. We're up here almost in an ivory tower controlling all the air traffic, but the airside safety team, they're our eyes and ears, and they'll get guys out there as quick as possible, clear the runways, and then hand them back to us to use again. Shops are away, brakes are off. Doors automatic and cross-check, all good. Glenn is one of the airside safety team's 70 officers. It's 8 a.m., and he's just started his day shift patrolling the airfield. It's all FOD free. Foreign object debris, basically rubbish. FOD and aeroplanes don't go together. You've only got to get a little bolt like that, get sucked up into the intake of an engine, and it's not good. Ah, there we go. I'm not too sure what that is. Right, what have we got? Well, how on earth does a pair of men's briefs get out of the taxiway? Not my size. Glenn's colleagues, Ed and Stu, have an even more critical duty. Checking the runways are free of debris. We're about to commence our runway inspection of 27 right. Checker, exit 09 left, Delta 1. They're waiting for the command from Air Traffic Control, or ATC, to enter the arrivals runway. And ATC will create a gap for us of about 12 miles. And so while we're on the runway, there will be aircraft coming into land still.
can just see straight ahead, there's a little light in the distance. Mm -hmm. That is an aircraft coming towards us. Four minutes. About four minutes. It's important to, to drive at a good steady speed so you can take everything in. So if something does happen and there is an accident, then they would look at our inspection, see if we're accountable. Obviously, if we go out there and find the surface starting to break up on the runway, that could even mean a closure of the runway. The guys on the ground, they've got to make that decision. Do we close the runway and cause a lot of problems, or can they deal with it there and then? Is it just something that needs picking up, putting in the back of the truck and driving on, or is it something that's a little bit more serious than that? Runway inspection in progress, surface wind 330 degrees, 9 knots. Almost looks like there's something up here and we'll just have to centre line. It's three minutes before the next plane hits the tarmac. The smallest debris can be a hazard, with aircraft landing at 150 miles per hour. Plastic bags, obviously, um, they can get ingested into the engines and they melt and they can just basically ruin an engine of an aircraft. Anything like that, that can get ingested, it causes millions of pounds worth of damage to an aircraft. So when people are working, picking up a bag and putting it in the bin, it could have just saved millions of pounds. Until the runway's been declared safe, no planes can land. Each minute a plane is delayed costs money. Everyone wants their day to go smoothly. If you don't find anything on the runway, there is a sense of relief. You're quite happy about that. Two at one four golf mic, continue microwave runway two seven left. Every plane that lands carries hundreds of stories. <laughs> 22-year-old Lewis drove from Devon last night to wait for an American girl he's never even met. There she is with her dog, her and Ping the dog. I found her on a dating site, and obviously you don't expect someone on a dating site from over 3,000 miles away to be of a romantic interest. You know, you get the classic, oh, is she a man? It's like, no, she's definitely not a man. The rose has wilted a bit. It feels as I do. I was waiting really nervously at the arrival, international arrivals, for her to come here. And then she was circling overhead, and then they ran out of fuel, so they had to get diverted to Gatwick. So I've been waiting here ever since. Hopefully it'll come alive when she arrives. He's been in arrivals for nearly three hours and can't see her flight on the board. I've been to the toilet about four times already just due, due to the nerves. So she has landed. She has landed. My throat's gone all dry and my heart rate is going and... Ooh. I sent Terminal 5 when I looked up this morning. I'm waiting for about three hours. Three hours? At least they landed. Landed 11.49. Oh, Terminal so 3. You better run. You've got to go. About 30 minutes, go. Have I got 30? Yeah, but she landed about... Oh, I don't know. Right. Thanks, bye. Where'd I park? Oh, I've got to pay for parking now as well and everything. I'm having a day. Heathrow's five terminals cover an area the size of 1,700 football pitches. The task of making sure the entire airport runs smoothly falls to one person, the airport duty manager. Today, it's former cinema manager Anuj who's on call. If something went wrong there, about 350 people aren't watching the film that they really want to watch today. If something goes wrong here, we're affecting a lot of people's days. It is a mini city. It's got a quarter of a million people here daily. I do feel like the sheriff of the town, if you like. Hey, Mark. How you doing? Yeah, good. How's it going? We're just coming into the evening peak. It's starting to get busy now. Uh, pinch points at the moment, probably T4, immigration looks the busiest area. APOC is Heathrow's operating centre, it is the heart of what we do, it's mission control. I've been communicating with Border Force on any of the uh, arrivals, uh, plus 45 minutes. It is looking busy out there, so I'll pop out there and give them some support. OK, thanks, Chief. Thanks, Chief. Thanks, okay. If there is something that I need to attend, I'll be there in a heartbeat.
What time's the flight? Flight has arrived. Ah. But they were due to arrive at 12.05 today, bless them. There's about a 20-minute, half-hour wait on immigration. Oh, right. How old are the children? It's peak time in Terminal 3, and Anuj is helping an anxious family waiting for two children travelling unaccompanied from America. We don't know what to do. Oh, my God. When was that? Just now. Have you got, have, is there a number that we can call? Because I can go and meet them. We don't know what to do. His friend's going to be out of his mind, my brother in America. No, you can't. Have you got a number? No. Lauren, can you phone Deirdre? The young relatives have got lost somewhere between the plane and the arrivals hall. Mum, what are you crying for? They're very mature for the age Oscar one, Oscar one, Sailor. Yeah, I wonder if you can help. I'm just with a, a group of passengers expecting to meet a couple of unaccompanied minors. Now, they've just had a text message saying there was nobody there to meet us. Um, the cabin crew have got our passports. We don't know what to do. So, obviously, the guys at the front are a little bit worried. All right, thanks, mate. Cheers. Yeah, I can imagine how scary that would be for them Ireland's to be lost in an airport. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's good on behalf of the airline to keep the passport as well, isn't it? Well, isn't it? What you'll find is that an airline won't just leave them stranded. Oh, no, we know that. that. Yeah, no, that would never happen. We've had our kids fly. But again, they're probably <laughs> expecting us to be there. We're there. They don't yeah, realise yeah. that we can't yeah, be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is, is that a Delta flight there, by any chance? It is a Delta flight, yes. Funnily enough, I've got the duty manager of Delta on the phone right this second. Get them sorted out. Delta. If you go, they'll be there now. You'll see them. Just don't go through the doors. Oh, there he is. Oh, it's not there. Hello, Patrick. Such a stress. He's a lovely man. It's just a shame he's got that wedding ring on that finger. <laughs> as, as old as I am, I could still do something with a young man. <laughs> she says this to all the men. Yeah, I was thinking I was special. You are, no doubt. I've got a lovely husband. You've got a nice man at Right, she's definitely here somewhere. After waiting for three hours in the wrong terminal, Lewis is still trying to find his transatlantic internet date. I think our London Eye trip's looking a bit of a non-goer now. It's 12.30 and we're meant to be on the eye at two, so... Oh, well. Later on, we're going to see Phantom of the Opera. Tomorrow, we've got the Tower of London booked. Then we're heading to Paris for two days. Right, hopefully, hopefully this is it. And then we're straight back here and I'm going to take her around my hometown in Devon. And then we're going to go to the Doctor Who exhibition in Cardiff on Wednesday before she sets off again on Thursday. I'm pretty certain she could be the one. Oh, uh, I'm finally here. <laughs> and I bought you. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I've, my rose has wilted. I'm awfully oh, sorry. Oh, it's, it's OK. I know it's a long way. <sighs> I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's been oh. such a way. I know, oh. I know, I know. It's just crazy. I just don't even know what to say. No, I don't know anymore either. <laughs> I've planned so long for this moment, and now I just lost for words. <laughs> I was just so nervous when we were approaching Heathrow, just circling for a while, and now it's, it's happening, and I'm so happy, and I can't wait to start this wonderful adventure. <laughs>《9 o'clock on Wednesday morning. Five and a half thousand passengers will land at Heathrow over the next hour, and it's down to the baggage handlers to get their bags to them as fast as possible. We're off to stand 326 for the US inbound, and we try and get there before the aircraft gets there. That's the general idea. Well, you've always got to watch where you're going because aircraft have right away all the time. There's only one winner. They're a little bit bigger than we are. <laughs> Steve works for Donata, one of the handling agents that compete for the airline's business at Heathrow. You've got to, got to please the customer. You please the customer, you keep the contract, and everybody's happy. Everyone keeps their jobs. As supervisor, Steve is responsible for offloading the plane within a strict time limit. From the minute we open the, the doors for the aircraft, it's been only had between 12 and 15 minutes 
That's your deadline to get your first bags down to the baggage hall where the passengers are waiting for their bags. Comes in, you offload it, and then the catering trucks come on, the cleaners come on, every man and his dog comes on. And then you load it back up again. The buck stops with me, unfortunately. It's highly pressurised. Yep. First class. Between 35 and 50 bags in each bin, depending. Generally, they fill them up. Depends how many passengers on the aircraft. The bins, also called unit loading devices, or ULDs, are moved with the aid of electric rollers. This is what drives the ULDs out of the aircraft. So if you put all the stops up, so it all stays in place. No stops, then all the cargo and all the ULDs would move. Anything that can't go into bins is carried separately at the back of the plane, in hold five. Money, gold, human remains, wild animals, anything could be in hold five. The strangest thing I found in hold five was an American bullfrog about this big. He was on his side and he was frozen. So it's all secure now, we just ring base to tell them that the offload's complete. It's all about getting the bags down to the baggage hall for the customer. So the minimum weight, you know, you know what you're starting to eat off the aircraft, you want your bags, this is how they get them. Job done. The race to get bags to passengers continues at the terminal, five minutes away by tug. It's a lot of bags. It's a lot of bags. Especially when you get about 10 of them coming at one time. <laughs> That's that gym work, man. Alex is one of just four baggage handlers hauling the flight load of 300 suitcases. As long as it ain't got an orange, orange sticker in it, not too bad. Anything that's got an orange sticker in it, approach with caution. Many of Heathrow's systems have been automated. But at Terminal 3, there's still only one way to get an arriving bag to a belt. I don't think they actually realise most of the stuff that's done in this airport is manual. Get it done as quickly as possible. Passengers are waiting for them, they can collect them. Be on their merry way. Hopefully, God willing. <laughs> It's not just baggage that's being unloaded today. Have you got ferrets up there? Yeah, there are ferrets up there. Haven't been buried, have they? No. no. OK, perfect. No. Let me know when and I'll come and get them. Thank you. Animal health officer Michelle needs to check the ferrets' paperwork before they leave the airport. They're under a huge amount of pressure from the airline and up upstairs, dispatchers, to get those bags off and get them to the customers. In some situations, they physically can't get to the animals because the animals have been put on first the other end and the bags are in front. But um, sometimes, literally, you'll see dogs sitting right at the front of the door and they'll lift the bags over and offload the bags first. For someone to prioritise a bag over a living animal is one of the most frustrating day-to-day -day things that I come across. And I quite often have very um, heated discussions with some of the loaders about this. Oh, look at them. Michelle's had no issue with today's loaders. The ferrets have been brought out quickly. They're very cute. Hi, guys. She's taking them to Heathrow's Animal Reception Centre, affectionately known as the Ark. <laughs> wow. Okay. It's a big old boy. It's too bloody big. Can we keep that lid down, though? Because what I don't want to do is wake him up, to be honest. The Ark processes nearly as many animals as the airport does humans. Last year, staff handled 16,000 pets, hundreds of thousands of reptiles and 25 million fish. Every animal that flies into Britain must comply with strict import laws. And Ark staff are responsible for checking each creature as it arrives. The first thing we'll be doing is verify the animal's identity. So whereas in our passports we have a picture, but for this guy here, we're verifying his identity from the microchip that's implanted under his skin. So we can, we can verify all the veterinary paperwork to this particular dog. Come on, puppy, how you get? Come on! In you go, puppy. If the pet's microchip or paperwork isn't in order, it could end up in quarantine. Even when you 
having a bad day, just seeing an animal that's all happy to see you, it just makes everything so much better. Like if you ask quite a few people here, they prefer to work with animals any day over working with a load of people. <laughs> 20-year-old Shannon is one of the ARC's newest recruits. When I was little, I wanted to be a vet. I've always wanted to work with animals, but I never knew I'd be at the airport. <laughs> oh, I couldn't leave someone like this behind. No, no, no. You're loving that, though, aren't you? You're doing the paperwork. Dealing with owners if the paperwork isn't in order can be... It's hard because you want to give their animals back as much as they want them back, but we have to go by the rules and regulations, so if they've got something wrong with the paperwork, then we have to abide by that. And now and again, you do get owners that will cry and get all upset and they'll get angry. But we have to do our job at the end of the day. Uh, Laura, this is Deborah Jones. Um, I need you to call back the Animal Reception Centre immediately here in the UK, in London. I am very, very upset that this paperwork was not done correctly. <sighs> Deborah is relocating from Los Angeles to the UK where her mum, Angela, lives. I've been sitting here for five hours now, waiting to get Bob and Sophie out of quarantine. She flew in with her two cats this morning. There's one just at the front and then one right at the back. So they, they seem a bit scared, seem a bit nervous. You have the number. It's already been given to you by a young woman that is handling our situation here. And I need you to call them back immediately or get the vaccine lot number for Bob's rabies vaccine faxed over to that number within the next five minutes, OK? Five minutes. Bye-bye. If they don't do it. If they don't happens? do it, worst case scenario, which I honestly don't think you need to worry about, is they will have to go to quarantine. But we have a 48 hours Both of them? before that. Just No, just, just Bob, oh, the one with information. Yeah. And how long how long's quarantine? The quarantine would be 21 days, oh, but we don't even need to think about that because it's just an urgent request form. It does happen frequently, it happens daily with America. Um, so it's these forms are being constantly sent off. So honestly, it's nothing to worry about. We just need the vet. I just I want your fault. No, I'm yeah, just I saying, completely but... understand that. We want your cats back to you as soon as we can as well. We really do. And we can't even see them. I just want to make sure that they're hydrated. As, uh, um, yeah, and, you know, I, I can make sure they are fine, they but were, if you prefer a vet to check... But Bob has issues with, you know... Yeah, no, if you prefer a vet to check, I can ask them if you want me to. It's entirely up to you. And they, you haven't seen them go to the bathroom or anything yet? They or haven't used the litter tray yet, no. OK. Good afternoon, APOC. Fire, police or ambulance. Back in Heathrow's control centre, APOC, a call is coming in on the airport's internal emergency line. OK, if you're on the line, I'll put you through to the police here at Heathrow and you can explain to them what happened, OK? We have uh, about 200,000 passengers coming through every day and it's important that we can get help to them as quick as possible. We can get up to 30, 40 ambulance calls per day. The airport pays the London Ambulance Service to have paramedics on site. Inside the terminals, the quickest way to reach patients is by bike. We are, in effect, an emergency ambulance. We've got everything that an ambulance has got. Um, I have the gentleman with me, and uh, he is conscious and breathing, over. Claire has been called to help a passenger who was just thrown in after injuring his back, cliff jumping in Mexico. So what's the problem? The gentleman had an injury whilst diving. OK. He's hurt his back in Cancun, and I'll let you take the rest. OK. I jumped into a sinkhole. Um, and shat my L1 vertebrate. Um, so that was 10 days ago. I had an operation there to get metal pins put into the spine. And now I've come back to England to get physio. I need to go to one of the hospitals, preferably West Middlesex, uh, yeah. so they can do a check and see. You need transport, don't you? But does it have to be an emergency ambulance? I don't want to put that strain on you. I'd need someone else to pick me oh, up and yeah, put, obviously, put me yeah. in the car. OK, all right. Well, I won't be a minute. OK. It actually put screws in your back there. In Mexico, they have to. Bebo's Charlie Romeo 18. The patient's parents aren't strong enough to lift him into their car, and he has no other way to get home. Uh, this patient basically needs transport to a hospital. He has had a, a diving accident, so the only way he can get to the hospital is by ambulance. Over. OK, um, I've got nothing available right now. But as soon as I can, I will. Roger, over. Roger, thank you. I went in feet first straight, and then as I approached the water, I kind of bent, and I think my arse just took all the force as it went into it. Right. Oh. 
Uh, right, so I've spoken to my control. They've got no emergency ambulance to send at the moment. I might be able to get hold of another person, like another paramedic, and between the two of us, we can get you into your parents' car. Or do you want to wait and I can keep an ambulance running? Yeah, let's just go into the car. You right. sure? Yeah. OK. Hello, Rob. Yeah. OK. We're going to have an arm each, aren't we? Yeah. What do you think? Because I don't want to hurt you at all. Get them out of the way. Just, it's just the side. If that's no, no, it's, it's, Rob, it's all right. I, can you put that other one in? There we go. Oh, yeah, just yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. London Ambulance Service would have sent an ambulance if that was the only way he could get home, because it's duty of care, but he may have had to wait a little while. Mm. Yeah. It would be a low category call, wouldn't it? Yeah, just yeah. it's not an acute problem. It's happened uh, a couple of weeks ago or whenever. And yeah, it's, it's yeah. Right here and now. We got there in the end, didn't we, Rob? We did. Couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> We have literally just received it by email. Thank you. Bye-bye. At the Animal Reception Centre, the paperwork for cats Bob and Sophie has come through. After a seven-hour wait, their owner Deborah can finally take them home. I'm so sorry. Let's in California. <laughs> Okay, you want to carry them? I can carry it for you okay, if you want to stay. Travelling in style, aren't they? We have six cases of luggage in the back, and this is what we hired. And Where was the luggage? We didn't know it was going to be this big. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Nice, Flobby. Look at Bob. Heathrow is Britain's biggest and most important airport. To protect it, the Metropolitan Police is a command unit of 400 officers based on site. It's a perfect place to check databases of all law enforcement agencies and see if someone's wanted. And I, I can sometimes know 12 hours ago, a man I need to arrest has got on a plane in Singapore and they will be landing. And I've got like seven, eight, nine hours to prepare to meet them at the end of a jetty and arrest them. Five hours into their shift, Duty officers Neil and Mark have had a tip off about a suspect on an inbound flight. 50's on. Cheers, Governor. Quite a serious offence. He's wanted for fraud. He may think he's, he's got away with it. We've got the intelligence to see he's on board. So we're going to know where he is, we're going to know what time he is. So therefore, we will go on the aircraft and meet him. If we were to meet him at the immigration hall, there is a slim chance we would miss him and we wouldn't want to miss this suspect for this offence. Can you obviously let, let the crew know then it's everyone... Nobody to move. Nobody to move, please. Thank you. Hey. Let's go. Like, like our colleague will go and I'll follow. Excuse me, sir. Can I ask your name, please? Have you got any... I could have a look at, please. Can I ask you to jump up and come with me, please? Yeah, I want to explain. Just grab all your luggage, please. That's everything. OK, just follow us. Why are you stopping, sir? Where is the time? You're wanted for fraud, OK? So you don't have to say anything. It may harm your defence. If you do not manage to one question, something which will let you lie in court. Anything you do say may be given in evidence. Turn yourself around for me, please. If we deem anyone to be dangerous or unsafe, they won't be getting walked through a public area. We have other means of getting them uh, landside and landing them officially. Everything's under control. The man was later released without charge. Animal health officer Vicky also needs to intercept a passenger getting off a plane today. Just off to a United flight, which is carrying emotional support animal, um, two dogs um, that are traveling in the cabin. Under US legislation, Pets don't have to fly in the hold, as long as the passenger has a doctor's note saying they need the pet with them for emotional support. 
I heard someone went out with a pygmy hedgehog once and I'd quite like to know what support that gave them in the, in the cabin, but there we are. Emotional support animals have to pay, um, and it's £340 um, to come in into the cabin. To fly in the hole, it can be a lot more, around sort of £800 or so. Hi there, are you Tony? Yeah. I'm Vicky, I'm from the Animal Reception. Hello. Have you had a nice flight? Yeah, I did. It's, it's I mean, I'm terrified to fly. Um, the reason I did it, let my mom die in a plane crash, so oh my, my therapist yeah. said that maybe bringing the dogs with yeah. her. I'll just get their microchips first, if that's all right. Yeah. All right with strangers? Yeah, yeah, he, they're just kind of, I think, traumatised because they've been in here. Daddy. Hi. Hello. Do you like this? They've been in here for like 13 hours. Is there a place that I can take them to the loo? Unfortunately not, until you go all the way through um, out of the baggage, I'm afraid. Um, I'm flying from California. And so I'm just visiting uh, my boyfriend for the holidays. So I'm gonna, I've never spent a winter here. <laughs> Doesn't want to go back. He's like stronger than 10 men. <laughs> if you could just zip that zipper. Not long now. Um, when you get your bags, you go through the red bit to declare the dogs. Some officers haven't seen dogs in the cabin before, so they, they may want to have a, a little look. But we've checked the paperwork. The paperwork's absolutely fine. Because we're a rabies-free country, if I sign my name to something, I'm saying that that animal doesn't have rabies, that that animal is fine to come into the country. It's quite a lot of responsibility. Mm -hmm. Thank there you very go. much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Most passengers leave the airport as soon as they've got their bags. But former stockbroker Michael has been stranded here since he landed 12 days ago. <laughs> he has no money and no home to go to. You have to work very hard on keeping clean. I, I haven't got access to anywhere to clean my clothes. It's going to get very cold soon and I'm scared of being on the streets with no roof to go under. I'm scared of it. Michael was deported from Thailand when his visa expired. I came back to the UK after 11 years away, uh, working in Asia. I don't have any assets in the UK. Uh, all my friends are in Asia, pretty much, um, and I found myself a, a little bit stranded on arrival. All right, you're better off with the cheaper ones because you can get more. But... That's perfect. Fortunately for Michael, because he flew into Heathrow, he can get help from the UK's only airport-based social workers. Travel care. We work with deportees, homelessness, victims of crime, forced marriages, returnees, anybody who just needs the time and attention to resolve the situation. Hey, I'm Michael. I gather you've got a job centre appointment uh, Today? this afternoon. Is it this afternoon? Yes, that's right. Ten to three this afternoon. Ten to three. Okay. Um, did you get an Oyster card yesterday? I did, yes. Uh, Tatiana kindly gave me ten, ten pounds so I could okay. buy an Oyster card and okay. uh, have enough money to get there and back yesterday. Okay, well, what we'll do, we'll top it up so you can get to that appointment. Appreciate your help, I really do. Okay. Some people, they pick up the phone to a, a loved one or a friend and they're, 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 their situation is solved straight away. But other people, such as in Michael's case, maybe not as clear-cut as that. You know, I appreciate this kind of help um, because it's put me, a, it's pointed me in directions I wouldn't have otherwise been able to find out for myself trying to help people get out of the airport, start to move the situation forward. The bus driver tells you which stop. Just keep an eye on the, on the display screen, OK? Armed with a bus pass, Michael can now get to his job centre appointments. But he will be back to sleep at the airport tonight. Paramedic Claire has had a high priority call to meet the early evening flight coming in from Delhi. When you're called to a plane, I don't think you can ever guess what the patient's going to present with. We get heart attacks, we get um, people dying on planes. For the passengers, it's all worse because it's up in the plane, they can't get off. The person feels more vulnerable. The 
thing is you have to get there before they land, because otherwise everyone is so dis desperate to get off that sometimes it's a bit of a battle to get on and get to the patient. Thank you. Ciao. Right across. Oh, all right, lovely, thanks. So what's the problem? I've just been sick. Oh, have you? Um, yeah. And my stomach is just pretty much stabbing pain. And it's a stabbing uh, pain where? There. there, okay. Yeah. Now I'm just going to have a little feel of your stomach. Yeah. Does that hurt? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, right, okay. Take some deep breaths. Yeah. Now, because it's an unexplained abdo pain and I can't rule out a pain yeah. yeah, It could be a rumbling right. appendix. Yeah. Oh, don't worry, you'll be okay. If the patient is presenting with severe abdominal pain, and other um, significant symptoms. It can be quite serious. If somebody gets um, appendicitis, uh, the appendix can burst. What I would advise is if you're in that much pain still, I'd advise you to go to the hospital. Do you think I could get, if the taxi hasn't gone, if I could just struggle to get home? It's up to you. Yeah, passenger from stand 533, um, female with abdo pain, and she's declined hospital, is travelling home by car, and we'll seek medical assistance if required. Rachel, you're going to be fine. You take your hand back. Yeah. Take it easy. If they're adamant, then they're free to go home. You know, we can only advise. Claire was right to be concerned. The patient was later rushed to hospital for an emergency operation to remove a three centimetre gallstone. Virgin uh, India Zulu, thanks. Your pushbacks approved. Face the west. Reconing. The evening Follow peak the is over, walk. and Heathrow is winding down. Well, there's probably another ten flights to come in now. Then it's yeah, sleep time if you can. <laughs> With no home to go to, Michael is settling in for his thirteenth night at the airport. The, the problem with this is that you've got arms um, separating every chair, so it's not going to work for me, um, as opposed to this way. And suddenly I've got an improvement on either side of this one. In fact, this is where I slept last night. <laughs> this is my bed. <laughs> I'm aware if somebody tries to break in for this two zips, put that against the arm because if I don't have an arm, it's fall off. It wakes me up. Don't like that. This is just after my house was completed. Photos are all Michael has left of his life abroad. That's my wife, ex-wife. But these were happy days, really happy days. I just didn't have a clue what was going to happen. That would have to come close to me. When Michael's relationship I broke down, he was left with nothing. I expected to be working in Thailand. I didn't expect ever to get deported. Shoes off, feet up, pillow. Oh, deep joy. While his claim for benefits is being assessed, Michael is stuck living in Terminal 3. Do you know what kind of box it's travelled in? Animal health officer Tara is starting her night shift. She and her colleagues are preparing for a dangerous guest. Mm -hmm. Need a bit of muscle for that. It's not ideal to arrive at 10 o'clock at night when there's only two members of staff. I mean, personally, I've not been here that long. Mm -hmm. To me, it's probably one of the most dangerous animals. So I mean, I just have to be quite on the ball and make sure that the cage is up to scratch. Feeling the pressure a little bit. The crate has flown in from Greece and will be going on to San Diego Zoo tomorrow. It's a very big box. It's going to be really tight. The box contains a tiger and needs to be put in a secure room for everyone's safety, as long as it fits. Not sure the forks are going to go through with that door hanging down. I'm concerned about the integrity of the box. Am I looking at turning now? I'm not the best person to be driving this. That's not working for me. You've got to zigzag back. Size and weight. 
Good luck, guys. The tiger hasn't eaten since leaving Greece. Bit of chicken, bit of beef. Not sure what the preferences are, but we'll offer it to him anyway, just in case. Can't wait for the next mouthful. We've got a size of those teeth. Always an element of stress. It just depends on the individual animal, and um, I mean, you can crate train them all you like, but you know, I don't think you can really prepare them for, for gonna what's going to go on. All the noise. As scared as we are, I'm sure he's much more frightened. But the mood has changed now. We've offered him food. <laughs> it's completely outside of our control. We never know what's going to turn up. That's the beauty of the job. Heathrow is one of the busiest airports in the world, and its planes attract more than just passengers. Yeah, I love. I, I just, I just love doing it, you know. Do you be ready in five minutes, sir? Graham is on a day trip to the airport. When I decided to buy the van, plane spotting was uh, part of the ulterior motive. I know it's just a plane to you, and it's something with two two engines on the wing, and it off it goes, and you, you go to your nice summer holidays. But I'm an aviation enthusiast. Some do it purely for numbers, some do it for types of aircraft. There's, there's so many different forms of the hobby. The AIDU, I need that one as well. American Airlines 777. Graham is one of more than 20 plane spotters visiting this morning. On this computer is every plane in the world, every plane that's ever made and will be made for the next six months. We just like coming and taking a look. I just tag along, like, you know, but I don't mind. We got here at half nine and we will stay till eight o'clock in the evening. And then we go back to Luton to do it all over again tomorrow. <laughs> at Heathrow, most planes are guided to their stands by electronic systems. But today, a jet coming in from Ireland with a special cargo needs the personal touch. We're bringing the aircraft round, stop him here. You've got your bins here, and the handling agents can get stuck in and do what they need to do. So it's for passion. Being an enthusiast, it's to work with aircraft is quite, it's quite something quite special. Well, these are my little marshalling gloves. We use bats, we use sticks, we use gloves. I like to use gloves. They're nice and orange, and hopefully everybody will see you. I've got my ear defenders here as well, which uh, should do the trick but I'm deaf already, but don't tell everybody. The plane's cargo is one prize-winning racehorse on a stopover to Australia to compete in the Melbourne Cup. He's going down for the Cox Plate in Melbourne. He's an extremely smart horse. And uh, they've got great hopes for him to win the Cox Plate. So, yeah. Not into horses, but uh, nice to see. Aeroplanes, I'm afraid. It's, it gets me going. After 30 years at Heathrow, Glenn is a walking encyclopedia of aircraft. You've got a few photos of planes? I've got a few thousand. I've got slides, I've got photographs, I've got JPEGs. They're everywhere. Aircraft is a motivation for me. Passengers... I won't go there. <laughs> Michael's been stuck at Heathrow for more than two weeks, but he's finally had some good news. I did a very, very unusual thing, and I, I just followed the signpost within the airport terminal, and it said chapel. I'm not a religious person. I'm totally agnostic. After I came out of there, I don't know if it was anything to do with the chapel. If it was, I'm not agnostic anymore. DWP have finally agreed my claim, which changes everything. Michael can now claim benefits money, and with the help of Heathrow's social workers, 
He's also managed to get a bed in a hostel. It gives me an address from which I can look for a job. It'd be nice to say goodbye to Heathrow and not see it again for a long time. It's the first step of really getting back to normal. And I'm looking forward to a bed for the night. Next week, the world's biggest passenger plane arrives at the airport. And then they wonder why baggage staff get bad backs. Trouble is brewing in the new multi-billion pound Terminal 2. It's going to get a bit messy if we start arresting people here at the moment. And Heathrow prepares for a special visitor. Really pumped, really excited about this. <laughs>